Herbert Glyde Lewis, an American novelist and screenwriter who died in 1950, is one of my favorite discoveries since starting the neglected books page. He wrote at least one masterpiece, Gentlemen Overboard, that's been rediscovered by publishers in Buenos Aires and Israel, but still waits to be reissued in English. A native New Yorker, Lewis spent a few years in China as a newspaper reporter, then returned to the U.S. While still working as a reporter for the New York Journal, he started writing short stories, one of which was published in Esquire alongside those of Fitzgerald and Steinbeck. In 1937, he published his first novel, Gentleman Overboard. It's a short novel, about 150 pages in all, and not one word is put to waste. In the opening scene of the book, Henry Preston Standish, a wealthy New Yorker traveling around the world as we, he goes through what we call today a midlife crisis, slips on a bit of kitchen grease as he takes an early morning stroll around a small passenger ship and tumbles into the Pacific Ocean. No one notices. Several passengers and crew members think they see him, and what with the rush of the day's tasks and the general inclination not to bring up unpleasant issues, no one says a thing about his absence until over ten hours later. Meanwhile, Standish treads water. After the initial shock, he calms down and pledges to wait patiently for rescue. After a while, he kicks off his shoes and jacket. A bit later, the shirts and pants go, and then his shorts, and the hours wear on, and things grow very dark. A reader in Goodreads described Gentleman Overboard as Woodhouse meets Sartre, and that's a wonderful way to capture the book's tone. It's comic, absurd, grim, but at the same time light, elegant, and precisely balanced. In its way, it's a perfect book. The book got mixed reviews. Time liked it. Kirkus Reviews called it a trick book and a slight one, but exceptionally well handled. The Saturday Review called it minor. And like Prenley Preston Standish, it quietly vanished from sight. By this time, however, Lewis had gone bankrupt and accepted an offer to work as a screenwriter in Hollywood. He spent a couple of years there, had several of his stories filmed, but then headed back to New York. He published his second novel in 1940. Spring Offensive is a bit like Gentleman Overboard remade as an anti-war protest. This time, Lewis takes a young American, Peter Winston, a volunteer with the French Army, based along the German border during the so-called Phony War. Early one morning, an all-out attack finds him isolated and trapped in a no-man's land between the two sides. As the battle grinds on, Peter's thoughts drift back and forth from memories of his life in Indianapolis to the noise and shocks of combat, until his little shell hole takes a direct hit and he vanishes into thin air. Lewis's timing was perfect, too perfect. A few weeks after the book was published, the Germans did attack. The Blitzkrieg rolled over Allied forces in France and Belgium, and the war became too real for anyone to be interested in a fictional version. Ralph Ellison did, although, give a very enthusiastic notice in the new masses, but spring offensive, just as fast and completely as Peter Winston disappeared. Lewis's third novel, Season's Greeting, was published about a year later in 1941. Bad timing once again. Released just before Thanksgiving, it should have been a natural winner with its stories of heartbreaks and heartwarmings in Greenwich Village at Christmas time. Unfortunately, a little while later, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and suddenly no one was in the mood for holiday fiction. Season's Greetings takes us through a couple of days in the lives of the various residents of a Greenwich Village rooming house. We get everything from young romance to middle-aged jealousy to the despair of old age. In one of the finest passages, Lewis relates the thoughts of an old woman who falls down the basement staircase and lies helpless 
unable to move or speak. Mrs. Fanjoy had looked at the purple-black, looked at it and dissected it, and mentally run her fingers through its rich thickness, for a timeless time of endless minutes and hours, until at last she had seen it start to fade. She had watched it fade, watched it thicken and solidify, and drop down into the well of darkness around her, until the last hard fleck of it was no more, and then, all of a sudden, it was black, black, and Mrs. Fanjoy knew what time it was. Another failure to his credit, Lewis once again headed to Hollywood. 20th Century Fox optioned one of his magazine stories and filmed it starring William Bendix. Other stories were picked up, and in 1947 he and co-writer Frederick Stefani were nominated for an Oscar for their story for the movie It Happened on Fifth Avenue, itself a neglected classic. Lewis, who had always been politically active, served as an editor for the screenwriter, the Screenwriter Guild's magazine, which was an early opponent of the red-baiting that was beginning to infect Hollywood. Lewis earned a few mentions in the records of the Senate's investigation into un-American activities, and soon word would, work was hard to come by. He joked to a columnist, recalling Lord Grey's words at the outbreak of World War I, The swimming pools are drying up all over Hollywood. I do not think I shall ever see them filled again in my generation. In reality, he suffered a nervous breakdown and headed back to New York one last time. Divorced now and in poor health, he lived in a cheap hotel and worked for Time magazine for a while, before suffering a heart attack and dying at the age of 41. Nine years after his death, a fourth novel, The Silver Dark, appeared in a cheap paperback edition. The Silver Dark is the love story of two outcasts, an embittered dwarf and a shy and reclusive hunchback woman. They meet one night as they sit in the darkness of a Manhattan rooftop and share a few moments of peace and companionship. The man grows obsessed with the idea that the woman is his only chance for romance. He follows her to California, wears down her initial resistance, and eventually convinces her to marry him. It's all quite reckless and wrong, and yet, somehow, the book ar arrives at a satisfactory end. It's not his best book, but it is intriguing and readable. The book was apparently edited by Lewis's widow, who got it published with the help of a literary agent. And like Lewis's first three books, it sank without a trace. Leap Forward Fifty Years Diego D'Onofrio, the editor of La Bestia Equiladra, a small press in Buenos Aires, emailed me asking to suggest some neglected books that might appeal to his readers. I mentioned Gentleman Overboard, and a year or so later, Diego wrote to announce that he'd arranged to have it translated into Spanish, and was publishing it as El Caballero Que Cayo Al Mar. You can see even a website for the book online at elcaballerocayo.com.ar. This book led to a conversation with Shira Heffer and Ariel Kahn, the editors of Zicket Books, an Israeli publishing house. They read the piece on my site, located an old copy of the book, and in 2012 released a translation of the book into Hebrew. You can find it at zicketbooks.com. I can only hope now that some English language publisher will catch on too. Gentleman Overboard is uniquely comic and a serious book, and it begs to be brought back to print. The works of Herbert Clyde Lewis have waited long enough to be rescued. You can find out more about these novels and works by other fine writers on the Neglected Books page at www.neglectedbooks.com.